Section 5 of Roman History, the Early Empire by William Wolfe Capes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 2. Tiberius, A.D. 14 to 37, Part 1. Tiberius Claudius Nero was the son of Tiberius Nero and Livia, and was carried by them while still an infant in their hurried flight after the surrender of Perugia. On their return to Rome, after the general peace, his parents were separated by the imperious will of Octavianus, who made Livia his wife. Losing his father at the age of nine, and taken from the nursery to pronounce the funeral speech, he was placed again under his mother's care, and became the object of her ambitious hopes. He married the daughter of Agrippa, and loved her well but was forced to leave her afterwards for Julia, who brought as her dowry the prospects of the imperial succession. He was soon sent to learn the business of a soldier, serving in the campaign in Pannonia and Germany, and dispatched on missions of importance, such as to crown Tigranes in Armenia as a subject prince, and to carry home the eagles which had been lost in Parthia by Crassus. At home, all the old offices of state were pressed upon him, till at last he was honoured even with the significant honour of the tribunician power. Yet Augustus seems to have had little liking for him, and to have noted keenly all his faults, the taciturn sullenness which contrasted painfully with the emperor's gayer moods, his awkward gestures and slow articulation when he spoke, the haughtiness of manner which came naturally to all the Claudian line, and the habit of hard drinking, on which the rude soldiers spent their wit when they termed him punningly Babarius Mero. The emperor even went so far as to speak to the senate on the subject, and to say that they were faults of manner rather than of character. For the rest we hear that he was comely in face and well-proportioned, and handsome enough to attract Julia's fancy, nor could he be without strong natural affection, for he loved his first wife fondly, and lived happily with Julia for a while, and showed the sincerest sorrow when his brother Drusus died. This is all we hear of him till the age of thirty-five. Then comes a great break in his career. Suddenly, without a word of explanation, he wishes to leave Rome and retire from public life. Livia's entreaties, the emperor's protests, and the remonstrances of friends have no effect, and having wrung from Augustus his consent, he betakes himself to Rhodes in 6 BC. What were his motives cannot now be known. It may have been in part his disgust at the guilty life of Julia, who outraged his honour and allowed her paramours to make merry with his character, in part perhaps weariness at being always kept in leading strings at rome but most probably it was jealousy at the rising star of the young grandsons of the emperor and fear of the dangers that might flow from too visible a rivalry in the pleasant isle of rhodes he lived a while quietly enough though he could not always drop his rank one day he was heard to say that he would go and see the sick he found that he was saved the trouble of going far in search as the magistrates had them all brought out and laid in order under the arcades with more regard to his convenience than theirs another time when a war of words was going on among the wranglers in the schools he stepped into the fray and was so much hurt at being roughly handled that hurrying home he sent a guard to seize the poor professor who had ventured to ignore his dignity at length growing weary of his stay at Rhodes, he said that the young princes were now secure of the succession, and that he might safely take a lower place at Rome. But Augustus coldly bade him stay, and take no further trouble about those whom he was so determined to forsake. Then came a time of terrible suspense. He knew that he was closely watched, and that the simplest words were easily misjudged the emperor reproached him with tampering with the loyalty of the officers who put in at Rhodes to see him. He shunned the coast and lived in solitude to avoid all official visits, and yet he heard to his alarm 
that he was still regarded with suspicion that threatening words had passed about him in the intimate circle of the young caesars that his prospects looked so black that the citizens of nemausus nimes had even flung his statue down to curry favour with his enemies that his innocence would help him little and that at any moment he might fall only thrasyllus his astrologer might see him to excite him with ambiguous words but livia's influence was strong enough at last to bring him back to rome in two a d after more than seven years of absence to live however in complete retirement in the gardens of mycenas to take like a schoolboy to mythology and pose the grammarians who formed his little court with nice questions about the verses which the sirens used to sing or the false name which the young achilles bore not until the death of the young caesars was he taken back to favour and adopted by the emperor as his son but the weariness of those long years of forced inaction the lingering agony of that suspense had done their work and he resigned himself henceforth without a murmur to the emperor's will not a moment of impatience at the caprices of the sick old man not an outspoken word nor hasty gesture now betrayed his feelings but as an apt pupil in the school of hypocrisy about him he learned to dissemble and to wait the only favour that he asked was to take his post in every field of danger and to prove his loyalty and courage with all his powers of self-restraint he must have breathed more freely in the camp than in the stifling air of rome and the revolt in pannonia gave him the opportunity he needed that war said to be the most dangerous since the wars with carthage tasked for three years all his resources as a general at the head of fifteen legions scarcely was it closed when the defeat of varus summoned him to the german frontier to avenge the terrible disaster in the campaigns that followed he spared no vigilance or personal effort shared the hardships of the soldiers and enforced the rigorous discipline of ancient generals not only does wellius patercolus who served among his troops speak of his commander in terms of unbounded praise but later writers who paint generally a darker picture describe his merits at this time without reserve from such duties he was called away to the deathbed of augustus whom he found at nola either dead already or almost at the last gasp but livia had been long since on the watch and had strictly guarded all approach to his bedside and let no one know that the end was near till her son was ready and their measures had been taken he had been long since marked out for the succession by the formal act of adoption which made him the natural heir as also by the partnership in the tribunitian dignity which raised him above all other subjects but the title to the sovereign rank was vague and ill-defined and no constitutional theory of succession yet existed as the empire by name and origin rested on a military basis the consent of the soldiery was all-important if the traditions of many years were to have weight the senate must be consulted and respected the legions were far away upon the frontiers in greatest force upon the side of germany and pannonia and the first news that came from the north was that the two armies were in mutiny clamouring for higher pay and laxer discipline the hasty levies raised after the defeat of varus had lowered the general morale and carried to the camp the turbulent license of the capital on the rhine there was the further danger that germanicus his nephew who was then in supreme command should rely on his influence with his troops and lead them on or be led by them to fight for empire this son of drusus who had been the popular idol of his day and who was said to have hankered after the old liberties of the republic had won himself the soldiers hearts by his courtesy gallantry and grace and the familiar name of germanicus which they gave him is the only one by which history has known him since they were ready to assert their right to be consulted the power which they defended was in their hands to give at a word from him and if that word had been spoken they would certainly have marched in arms to rome but he was not fired by such ambitious hopes nor had he seemingly any sentimental dreams of ancient freedom he took without delay 
the oath of obedience to Tiberius, restored discipline after a few anxious days of mutiny, and then tried to distract the thoughts of his soldiers from dangerous memories by a series of campaigns into the heart of Germany. Tiberius, meanwhile, at home was feeling his way with very cautious steps. While he was still uncertain of the attitude of Germanicus and the temper of the legions, he used nothing but ambiguous language, affected to decline the reins of state, kept even the Senate in suspense, and at last, with feigned reluctance, accepted office, only for a while till they should see fit to give him rest. It was in keeping with such policy that he shrank from the excess of honors which the Senate tried to lavish on him, and declined even the titles which Augustus had accepted. Either from fear or from disgust, he showed dislike to the flattery which was at first rife about him, checked it when it was outspoken, and resented even as a personal offense the phrases lord and master as applied to him. Meantime, the Senate was encouraged to think that the powers of administration rested in their hands. Nothing was too paltry, nothing too grave to be submitted for their discussion. Even military matters were at first referred to them, and generals in command were censured for neglecting to report their doings to the council. The populace of Rome, however, was treated with less courtesy. The ancient forms of the elections were quite swept away, and in legislation also the Senate took the place of the popular assembly. Little attempt was made to keep the people in good humor by shows of gladiators or gorgeous pageants, and Tiberius would not try to put on the studied affability with which Augustus sat for hours through the spectacles, or the frank courtesy with which he stayed to salute the passers-by. But on the other hand, he showed himself at first sincerely desirous of just rule, warned provincial governors who pressed him to raise higher taxes that a good shepherd shears but does not flay his sheep, and kept a careful watch on the tribunals to see that the laws were properly enforced. Vigorous measures were adopted to put down brigandage. The police of Italy were better regulated. Popular disturbances in the capital or in the provinces were promptly and even sternly checked, and many of the abuses were remedied which had grown out of the old rights of sanctuary. The policy of the early years of the new reign must have been largely due to Livia's influence. For many years Tiberius had been much away from Rome, and it was natural that he should at first rely upon his mother's well-tried statecraft, her knowledge of men and familiar experience of the social forces of the times. He owed all to her patient scheming, even if she had not, as men thought, swept away by poison the obstacles to his advancement. Her position was for many reasons a commanding one. The will of Augustus had named her as co-heiress, giving her the official title of Augusta, and raised her by adoption to the level of her son. She shared with him, therefore, in some measure the imperial dignity. Their names were coupled in official language. The letters, even of Tiberius, ran for some time in her name as well as his. There were numerous coins of local currency at Rome and in the provinces on which her name was stamped, sometimes joined with her sons, but oftener alone. At her bidding or by her influence, priesthoods were formed and temples rose in all parts of the empire to extend the worship of the deified Augustus, and inscriptions still preserved upon them testify to her pride of self-assertion, as well as to the policy with which she strove to surround the imperial family with the solemn associations of religious awe. To that end also she enlisted the fine arts in her service, and found employment for the first sculptors, engravers, and painters of the day, in multiplying copies of the features of the ruling race and endearing them to the imagination of the masses. The Senate was not slow to encourage the ambition of Augusta. Vote after vote was passed as the members tried to outdo each other in flattery, till they raised her even to the foremost place and proposed to call the Emperor Livius to do her honor. Tiberius indeed demurred to this, and before long there were signs clear enough to curious eyes that he was ashamed to feel he owed her all, impatient of her tutelage, and jealous of her high pretensions. 
men spoke in meaning whispers to each other and wits made epigrams on the growing coldness between mother and son they said he vainly strove to keep her in the shade old as she was she clung to power and state and relied on her talents and influence to hold her own the senate in the camp she could not visit but in all else she claimed to rule as he seemed to shun the eyes of men she came forward more in public won popular favour by her courtesies and generous gifts gathered her crowd of courtiers round her conferred at her will the offices of state and tried to overawe the courts of justice when the interests of her favourites were at stake in the circle of her intimates we hear of irreverent wits whose caustic speeches did not spare the emperor himself and once we read when words ran high between augusta and her son she took from her bosom old letters of augustus and read sarcastic passages that bore on his faults of manner or of temper this coolness did not lead to open rupture for his old habits of obedience were confirmed enough to bear the strain and he submitted to her claims though grudgingly and ungraciously enough on the whole she used her influence wisely and while she ruled the policy of state was cool and wary she could be stern and resolute enough when force seemed needful she had given orders for the death of agrippa posthumus as soon as his grandfather had ceased to breathe she did not plead for pity with her son when he let julia die a wretched death of slow starvation in her prison and took at last his vengeance on her paramour for the mockery and outrage of the past it is likely even that her quick eye saw the use that might be made of the old laws of treason which had come down from the commonwealth they had been meant to strike at men who had by open act brought dishonour or disaster on the state sulla was the first to make them cover libellous words and augustus had though sparingly enforced them in like cases the caesar had already stepped into the people's place and screened his majesty against so-called treason but when the caesar had been deified any crime against his person was heightened by the sin of sacrilege in the language of the law obedience to the living emperor soon became confounded with the religious worship of the dead and loyalty became in theory a sort of adoration any disrespect might carry danger with it jesting words against the late emperor might be construed into blasphemy when the emperor had become a god his likeness must be held in honour and it might be fatal even to beat a slave who clung for safety to his statue or to treat carelessly his effigy upon a coin a few such cases were enough to increase enormously the imperial prestige and extend to the living members of the family some of the reverence that was gathering round the dead but though augusta had few scruples she had no taste for needless bloodshed and while she lived she certainly exercised a restraining influence upon her son another of the emperor's family exerted a force of like restraint though in a very different way germanicus was the darling of the legions and might at any moment be a pretender to the throne he had calmed his mutinous soldiery led them more than once into the heart of germany visited the battlefield where varus fell and brought back with him in triumph the captive wife and child of arminius the national hero of the germans it might seem dangerous to leave him longer at the head of an army so devoted to their general dangerous perhaps to bring him back to win the hearts of men at rome but his presence might be useful in the east for the kingdoms of parthia and armenia had been torn by civil war and thrown into collision by the claims of rival candidates for power and by wars of succession due in part at least to the intrigues of rome a general of high repute was needed to protect the frontier and appease the neighbouring powers and the death of some of the vassal kings of asia minor had left thrones vacant and wide lands to be annexed or organised it was resolved to recall germanicus from his post and to dispatch him to the syrian frontier on this important mission on the north there was little to be gained by border warfare which provoked but could not crush the resistance of the german tribes and there was wisdom in following the counsel of augustus not to aim at further conquests 
Germanicus might be unwilling to retire, but the duties to which he was transferred were of high dignity and trust. Wise men noted with alarm that Solanus, who was linked to him by ties of marriage, was recalled from Syria at the time, and the haughty, self-willed Gnaeus Piso made governor in his stead. Dark rumors spread abroad that he had been chosen for the task of watching and of thwarting the young prince, and that his wife Plancina had been schooled in all the petty jealousies and spite of which Agrippina was the mark. So far, at least, all was mere suspicion, but there was no doubt that when they went to Syria, the attitude of Piso was haughty and offensive. He made a bold parade of independence, disputed the authority, and cavilled at the words and actions of Germanicus, tampered even with the loyalty of the soldiers, and drove him at last to open feud. When Germanicus fell ill soon afterwards, Piso showed indecent glee, and though he was on the eve of quitting Syria, he lingered till further news arrived. He put down by violence the open rejoicing of the crowd at Antioch when cheerful tidings came. Still he waited, and the murmur spread that the sickness was his work, and that poison and witchcraft had been used to gratify his spite, and perhaps to do the emperor's bidding. Germanicus himself was ready to believe the story and to fear the worst. The suspicions gained force as he grew weaker, and his last charge on his deathbed to his friends was to expose his murderer and avenge his death. 19 A.D. The sad story was received at Rome with passionate sorrow and resentment. His father's memory, his noble qualities and gentle bearing, had endeared him to all classes, and men recalled the ominous words that those whom the people love die early. One after another their favorites had passed away, cut off in the springtime of their youth, and now the last of them, the best beloved perhaps of all, had been sent away from them, they murmured, to the far east to die from the noxious air of Syria, or it might be from the virulence of Piso's hate. End of section 5section six of roman history the early empire by william wolfe capes this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter two tiberius a d fourteen to thirty seven part two still more outspoken was the grief when the chief mourners reached the shores of italy and passed in sad procession through the towns at the sight of the widowed agrippina and the children gathered round the funeral urn that held his ashes all classes of society vied with each other in the tokens of their sympathy there was no flattery in such signs of mourning for few believed that tiberius was sorry and many thought that he was glad at the loss they regretted was it grief that kept him in the palace or fear lest men should read his heart was it due respect to his brave nephew germanicus to give such scant show of funeral honours, and to frown at the spontaneous outburst of his people's sorrow? Was it love of justice, or a sense of guilt that made him so slow to punish Piso's crime, so quick to discourage the zeal of his accusers? They could only murmur and suspect, for nothing certain could be known. At Piso's trial there was evidence enough of angry words and bitter feelings, of acts of insubordination, almost of civil strife. But no proof that Germanicus was murdered, still less that Tiberius was privy to the deed. It was indeed whispered abroad that the accused had evidence enough to prove that he only did what he was bidden. But if so, he feared to use it, and before the trial was over he died by his own hand. The popular suspicion against Tiberius was no mere afterthought of later days, when Rome had learnt to know the darker features of his character. From the first they had never loved him, and the more they saw, the less they liked him. He seemed of dark and gloomy temper, with no grace or geniality of manner, shunning the pleasures of the people, and seldom generous or open-handed 
he had even an ungracious way of doing what was right and spoiled the favor by his way of granting it there was such reserve and constraint in what he said that men thought him a profound dissembler and imputed to him crimes he had no thought of they seemed to have divined the cruelty that was still latent and to have detested him before his acts deserved their hate even in the early years the satires current in the city and the epigrams passed from mouth to mouth show us how intense was the dislike and soon we see enough to justify it one of the most alarming features of the times in which men traced his influence was the rapid spread of professional accusers of the delatores of whom we read indeed before but who now became a power in the state the roman law of early times looked to private citizens to expose wrongdoing and to impeach civil or political offenders sometimes it was moral indignation oftener it was the bitterness of party feeling and oftener still the passion of ambition that brought them forward as accusers the great men of the republic were constantly engaged in legal strife cato for example was put on his defence some four and forty times and appeared still oftener as accuser it was commonly the first step in a young man's career to single out a prominent member of the rival party to charge him with some political offence and to prove in the attack his courage or knowledge of the laws this practice naturally intensified the bitterness of party struggles and often led to family feuds it took to some extent the place of the dueling of modern times and led more than once to a sort of hereditary vendetta it oftener served the passions of a party than the real interests of justice and prized as it was as a safeguard and privilege of freedom fostered license more than liberty yet as if this tendency was not strong enough already measures were taken to confirm it more sordid motives were appealed to and hopes of money bribes were held out to spur on the accuser's zeal these it may be seemed more needful as moral sympathies were growing stronger and the party passions of the commonwealth were cooling down certainly the meaner motives must have been more potent in the days of the early empire when men came forward to enforce the sumptuary and marriage laws which were almost universally disliked we hear little of the delatores as a class under augustus but in the days of his successor they became almost at once of prominent importance the wider range given to the laws of treason the vagueness of the crimes that fell within their scope and the terror of the penalties that threatened the accused armed the informers with a class of weapons which they had not known before with a ruler like tiberius they became quite a new wheel in the political machinery it suited his reserve to keep himself in the background while the objects of his fear or his suspicions were attacked to learn the early stages of the trial from men who had no official connection with himself while the senate or the law courts were responsible for the result and he could step in at last to temper if he pleased the rigour of the sentence he did not own them for his instruments refused even to speak to them directly on the subject but with instinctive shrewdness they interpreted his looks divined his wishes and acted with eagerness upon a word that fell from any confidant whom he seemed to trust no wonder that their number grew apace for it seemed an easy road to wealth and honour settling even by threes and fours upon their victims they disputed the precedence of the attack for if they were successful the goods of the condemned might be distributed among them and when an enemy of caesar fell quite a shower of official titles was rained upon them they came from all classes alike some there were of ancient lineage and good old names some were adventurers from the provinces who had come to push their fortunes in the capital some even of the meanest rank who crowded into a profession where a ready tongue and impudence seemed the only needful stock in trade for all were trained in early youth to speak and plead and hold their own in the keen fence of words in the days of the republic all must learn to speak who would make their way in public life and the training of the schools remained the same when all besides was changed around them 
the orator's harangues had been silenced in the forum no cicero might hope to sway the crowd or guide the senate but they disputed still and declaimed and laboured at the art of rhetoric as if oratory were the one end and aim of life when life opened on them in real earnest they soon discovered how slowly honest and unaided talent could hope to make its way to fame the conditions of the times were changed and one only way was left to copy the great orators of earlier days they could yet win wealth and honour and make the boldest spirits quail and be a power in the state and gain perhaps the emperor's favour by singling out some man of mark high in office or in rank and furbishing afresh against him the weapons drawn from the armoury of the laws of treason if they were not weighted with nice scruples if they could work upon the ruler's fears or give substance to his vague suspicions if they were dexterous enough to rake up useful scraps of evidence and put their lies into a telling form then they might hope to amass great fortune speedily and rise to high official rank did any wish to pay off an old debt of vengeance or to force a recognition from the classes that despised them or to retrieve a shattered fortune and to find a royal road to fame it needed only to swell the ranks of the informers to choose a victim and invent a crime if no plausible story could be found to ruin him it was always possible to put into his mouth some threats against the emperor's life some bold lampoon upon his vices which they found already to hand the annals of the time are full of tales which show how terrible was the power they wielded through every social class and circle the poison of suspicion spread for every friend might prove a traitor and be an informer in disguise it might be perilous to speak about affairs of state for the frankest words of confidence might be reported and be dangerously misconstrued it might be dangerous to be too silent for fear of being taken for a malcontent a man's worst enemies might be in his home for every house was full of slaves who learned or guessed the master's secrets and whose eyes were always on the watch to divine the inmost feelings of his heart in a few minutes by a few easy words they could wreck their vengeance for the slights of years gain their freedom even by their master's death and with it such a slice of what was his as would make them rich beyond their wildest dreams no innocence could be quite secure against such foes for it was as easy to invent as to report a crime no council chamber was so safe but that some traitorous ear could lurk unseen for in one trial it appeared that three senators were hidden between the ceiling and the roof to hear the conversation of the man whom they accused there was no kind of life without its dangers to eschew politics was not enough the poet's vanity might lure him to his ruin if he ventured to compose an elegy upon the prince's son when the noble subject of his verse was sick not dead the historian's life might pay the penalty for a few bold words of freedom as cremudius cordus had to die for calling the murderers of caesar the last of the old romans philosophy itself might be suspected for a lecture on the whole duty of man might recognize another standard than the emperor's will and pleasure and handle his special faults too freely there was no escape from dangers such as these in earlier days men might leave rome before the trial was quite over and shun the worst rigour of the law by self-chosen banishment from home but the strong arm of the imperial ruler could reach as far as the farthest limits of the empire and flight seemed scarcely possible beyond one only road of flight lay open and to that many had recourse when the fatal charges had been laid men often did not stay to brook the ignominy of the trial or face the informer's torrent of invectives but had their veins opened in the bath or by poison or the sword ended the life which they despaired to save they hoped to rescue by their speedy death some little of their fortune for their children and to secure at least the poor advantage of a decent funeral for their bodies it was the emperor's suspicious temper that increased so largely the influence of the delatores for there was one man who gained his trust and gained it only to abuse it 
Lucius Aelius Sejanus had long since won favor by artful insight into character and affected zeal and self-devotion. His flattery was too subtle to offend, his duplicity so skillful as to mask completely his own pride and ambition, while he fed the watchful jealousy of his master by whispered doubts of others. His father, a knight of Tuscan stock, had been prefect of the imperial guards, ten battalions of which were quartered in different places round the city. When the son was raised to the same rank, his first act of note was to induce the emperor to concentrate the guards in one camp near the gates as the permanent garrison of Rome. That done, he spared no pains to win the goodwill of the soldiers, to secure the devotion of the officers, and raise his tools to posts of trust. To the real power thus secured, the rapidly increasing favor of Tiberius lent visible authority. In official language, he was sometimes named as the partner of the ruler's labors. Senators and nobles of old family courted his patronage with humble words. Official titles were bestowed at his discretion, and spies and informers speedily were proud to take rank in his secret service. While ambitious hopes were growing within him with the self-confidence of a proud and resolute nature, the passion of revenge came in to define and to mature them. Drusus, the young son of Tiberius, whom we read of as coarse, choleric, and cruel, happened in a brawling mood to strike Sejanus on the face. The blow was one day to be washed out in blood, but for the moment it was borne in silence. He made no sign to rouse suspicion but turned to Lavilla, the prince's wife, and plied her with his wily words, seconded by winning grace and personal beauty. The weak woman yielded to the tempter, flinging away her womanly honor, and with it tenderness and scruple, she sacrificed her husband to her lover. With her help he had Drusus poisoned, and so removed the heir presumptive to the throne. Next came the turn of Agrippina and her children. Between the widowed mother and Tiberius a certain coolness had grown up already, which it was easy to increase. Her frank, impetuous, high-souled nature could not breathe freely in the palace. Proud of her husband's memory and the promise of her children, and too reliant on the people's love, she could not stoop to weigh her words, to curb her feelings, and school herself to be wary and submissive. His dark looks and freezing manner stung her often to impatience, and she allowed herself to show too clearly the want of sympathy between them. The ill-timed warmth of Agrippina's friends, the dark insinuations of Sejanus, widened the breach already made, and each was made to fear the other and hint at poison or at treason. The thunderclouds had gathered fast, and the storm would soon have burst between them had not Augustus stayed his hand and stepped in with milder counsels. Jealous as he may have been, the son still submitted to the mother's sway. He feared an open rupture, while he chafed at her interference and restraint. Then the schemer thought of parting them. Away from Rome and from his mother, Tiberius would breathe more freely and lean more on his trusted servant, and he himself also could mature his plans more safely if he were not always watched by that suspicious eye. For twelve years the emperor had scarcely left the city, but he was weary at last of moving in the same round of public labors, of meeting always the same curious eyes, full as it seemed of fear or of mistrust. The counsels of Sejanus took root and bore their fruit in season. At first Rome only heard that its ruler was traveling southward, then that he was at Capri, the picturesque island in the Bay of Naples, which had tempted Augustus with its charms, and passed by purchase into his estates. Soon they thought he would be back again, but time went on, and still he came not, and though he talked at times of his return, and came twice almost within sight, he never set foot within their walls again. After three years he heard at Capri of his mother's death, A.D. 29, but he was not present at her funeral long neglected even to give the needful orders, and set at naught the last wishes of her will. Her death removed the only shield of Agrippina and her children. One after another their chief adherents had been swept away, 
the old generals that loved them had been struck down by the informers the relentless jealousy of the emperor and sejanus had for years set spies upon them to report and exaggerate unguarded words all the charges which had been gathered up meantime were at once laid before the senate in a message full of savage harshness the mother and her two eldest children were hurried off to separate prisons with litters closed lest the memory of germanicus should stir the people they languished there a while then perished miserably by sword and famine there was another whom the emperor had long looked at with unfriendly eyes asinius gallus a marked figure in the higher circles had taken to his house the wife whom tiberius had been forced indeed to put away yet loved too well to feel kindly to the man who took his place he had been named by the last emperor among the few who might aspire to the throne and was possibly the child the promise of whose manhood had been heralded by the fourth eclogue of virgil he was certainly forward and outspoken with something of presumption even in his flattery he had often given offence by hasty words and above all in the early scene of mutual distrust and fear in the senate house he had tried to force tiberius to use plain language and drop his hypocritic trifling he was made to pay a hard penalty for his boldness the emperor stayed his hand for years allowed him to pay his court and join in the debates among the rest and even summoned him to copri to his table but even while he sat there the news came that the senate had condemned him at the bidding of their master and he left the palace for a prison for years he pined in utter loneliness while the death which he would have welcomed as a boon was still denied him End of section six section seven of roman history the early empire by william wolfe capes this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter two tiberius a d fourteen to thirty seven part three meanwhile sejanus ruled at rome with almost absolute power his master's seemingly unbounded trust made soldiers senators informers vie with each other in submissive service his favour was the passport to preferment his enmity was followed by a charge of treason or a threatening missive from capri to the senate all classes streamed to his antechambers with their greetings and the world of rome flattered feared or hated him the emperor heard all intelligence through him coloured and garbled as he pleased approved his counsels re-echoed his suspicions and daily resigned more and more of the burden of rule into his hands there had been no sign of mistrust even when he had asked for the hand of Livilla, the widow of the murdered drusus though consent had been delayed and reproof of his ambition hinted yet wary as sejanus was he could not hide from envious eyes the pride and ambition of his heart he grew haughtier with the confidence of power and men whispered that in moments of self-indulgence he spoke of himself as the real autocrat of rome and sneered at his master as the monarch of the isle but that master's eyes at length were opened his brother's widow antonia long retired from public life had kept a watchful eye on all that passed and sent a trusty messenger at length to warn him he saw his danger instantly felt it with a vividness that seemed to paralyze his will and stay his hand for many months we have the curious picture of the monarch of the roman world brooding scheming and conspiring against his servant for months his letters were so worded as to keep sejanus balanced between fear and hope sometimes he writes as if his health were failing and the throne would soon be vacant sometimes promotes his friends and loads him with caresses and then again his strength is suddenly restored and he writes fretfully and sternly the senate is kept also in suspense but notes that he no more calls the favourite his colleague and that he raises a personal enemy to be consul the bolt falls at last 
suddenly there arrives in rome a certain macro with letters from capri for the senate he carries the commission in his pocket which makes him the new prefect of the guard and has been told to concert measures with laco the prefect of the watch he meets sejanus by the way alarmed to find that there is no message for himself and reassures him with the tale that the letter brings him the high dignity of tribunician power while sejanus hurries in triumph to the senate house macro shows his commission to the praetorians and sends them to their quarters far away while laco guards the senate house with his watch the reading of the emperor's letter then begins it is long and curiously involved in style deals with many subjects with here and there a slighting word against sejanus to which however he pays scant attention as his thoughts are occupied with the signs of favour soon to follow suddenly comes the unlooked-for close two of his nearest intimates are denounced for punishment and he is to be lodged at once in prison those who sat near had slipped away from him meantime laco with his guards is by his side while the senate rises on all sides and vents in angry cries the accumulated hate of years he is dragged off to his dungeon the people on the way greet him with savage jeers throw down the statues raised long since in his honour and the praetorians in their distant quarter make no sign the senate takes courage to give the order for his death thirty one a d and soon all that is left of him is a name in history to point the moral of an unworthy favourite's rise and fall his death rid tiberius of his fears but was fatal to the party who had looked to sejanus as their chief and possibly had joined him in treasonable plots against his master post after post brought the death warrants of fresh victims his kinsmen were the first to suffer then came the turn of friends and tools all who owed to him their advancement all who had shown him special honour paid the hard penalty of their imprudence the thirst for blood grew fiercer daily for the wife of sejanus on her deathbed told the story of the poison of which drusus had died and the truth was known at last tiberius had hidden his grief when his son died and treated with mocking irony the citizens of ilium who came somewhat late with words of condolence telling them that he was sorry that they too had lost a great man named hector but the grief he had then not shown turned now to thirst for vengeance on any plea that anger or suspicion could dictate fresh names were added to the list of the accused till the crowded prisons could hold no more the praetorians whose loyalty had been mistrusted were allowed to show how little they had cared for their commander by taking wild vengeance on his partisans the populace also roamed the streets in riotous mobs to prove their tardy hatred for his memory in a passage of the emperor's memoirs that has come down to us we read the charge that the fallen minister had plotted against agrippina and her children we may compare with this the fact that the order for the death of the second son was given after the traitor's fall he was starved to death in the dungeon of the palace after trying in his agony to gnaw the bed on which he lay and the notebook of his jailer gave a detailed account of his last words and dying struggles at capri also there was no lack of horrors there too the victims came to be tried under his eye it is said to be even tortured and to glut his thirst for bloodshed he watched their agonies upon the rack and was so busy with that work that when an old friend came from rhodes at his own wish he mistook the name of his invited guest and ordered him too to be tortured like the rest some asked to be put out of their misery by speedy death but he refused saying that he had not yet forgiven them even in trifling matters the like severity broke out a poor fisherman climbed the steep rocks at capri to offer him a fine lobster but the emperor startled in his walk by this unbidden visitor had his face gashed with its sharp claws to teach him more respect for rank nor is it only cruelty that stains his name sensuality without disguise or limit unnatural lusts too foul to be described 
debauchery that shrank from no excess, these are the charges of the ancient writers that brand him with eternal infamy. Over these it may be well to drop the veil and hasten onward to the close. At length it was seen that his strength was breaking up, and the eyes of the little court at Capri turned to Gaius, the youngest son of Agrippina and Germanicus, whom, though with few signs of love, he had pointed out as his successor. The physician whispered that his life was ebbing, and he sank into a swoon that seemed the sleep of death. All turned to the living from the dead, and saluted him as the new emperor, when they were startled with the news that the closed eyes were opened and Tiberius was still alive. But then, so ran the tale all Rome believed, the prefect Macro bade the young prince be bold and prompt. Together they flung a pillow on the old man's head and smothered him like a mad dog as he lay. The startling story of his later years is given with like features in the pages of three authors. Tacitus, Suetonius, and Dion Cassius, and none besides of ancient times describe his life or paint his character with any fullness of detail. But modern critics have come forward to contest the verdict of past history, and to demand a new hearing of the case. We must stay, therefore, to see what is the nature of their plea. They remind us that at the worst it was only the society of Rome that felt the weight of his heavy hand, Elsewhere, they say, through all the provinces of the vast empire his rule was wise and wary. His firm hand curbed the license of his agents, he kept his legions posted on the frontiers, but had no wish for further conquests, and in dealing with neighboring powers relied on policy rather than on force. The shelter that he offered to the fugitive chiefs of Germany and the pretenders to the eastern thrones gave him always an excuse for diplomacy and intrigues, which distracted the forces that were dangerous. Provincial writers like Strabo the geographer, Philo the philosopher, and Josephus the historian speak of his rule with thankfulness and fervor, and the praises seem well founded till we come to the last years of his life. Then, says Suetonius, he sank into a sloth which neglected every public duty. He would not sign commissions, nor change the governors once appointed, nor fill up the vacancies that death had caused, nor give orders to chastise the neighboring tribes that disturbed the border countries with their forays. It is true the empire was so little centralized as yet, and so much free life remained in the old institutions of the provinces that distant peoples scarcely suffered from the torpor of the central power, and once relieved from the abuses of the old republic, were well content if they were only left alone. Still, the degradation of Rome, if real, must have reacted on them, for she attracted to the centre the notabilities of every land. She sent forth in turn her thought, her culture, and her social influence, and the pulsations of her moral life were felt in countries far away. The heroism of her greatest men raised the tone of the world's thought, and examples of craven fear and meanness surely tended to dispirit and degrade it. If we return now to the details of his rule at home, what evidence can his defenders find to stay our judgment? They can point to the contemporary praises of Valerius Maximus, a literary courtier of the meanest type, and to the enthusiastic words in which Velius Paterculus speaks of his old general's virtues, but the terms of the latter do not sound like a frank soldier's language. The style is forced and subtle, and the value of his praises of Tiberius may well be questioned, when in the same page we find a fulsome flattery of Augustus and Sejanus that passes all bounds of belief. We may note also that his history ends before the latter period of his reign begins. In default of testimony of a stronger kind, attention has been drawn to the marks of bias and exaggeration in the story commonly received, to the wild rumors wantonly spread against a monarch who had never won his people's love, and lightly credited by writers who reflected the prejudices of noble coteries offended by the unyielding firmness of his rule. On such evidence it has been thought enough to assume that the memoirs of Agrippina, Nero's mother, and 
blackened the name of Tiberius and had a sinister influence on later history. To imagine a duel of life and death between the imperial government and the partisans of the widow and children of Germanicus. To believe, but without proof, that the chief victims of the times were all conspirators who paid the just forfeit of their lives. To point to the malignant power of Sejanus and to fancy that the real clemency of Tiberius took at last a sombre hue in the presence of universal treachery. Whence this strange mania of disloyalty can have come is not made clear, nor how it was that of the twenty trusted senators chosen for the privy council only two or three were left alive, nor why Drusus, the son of Germanicus, was murdered when the fall of Sejanus had removed the tempter. Nor can the stories of the debauchery at Capri be lightly set aside without disproof. They left a track too lurid on the popular imagination, they stamped their impress even in vile words on the language of the times and gave a fatal impulse to the tendencies of the corrupted art that left the records of its shame among the ruins of Pompeii. It may seem strange indeed, as has been urged, that a character unstained for many years by gross defects should reveal so late in life such darker features but we have no evidence which will enable us to rewrite the story of these later years, though on some points we have reason to mistrust the fairness of the historians whose accounts alone have reached us. They do seem to have judged too harshly acts and words which admit a fair and honourable colour. Their conclusions do not always tally with the facts which they bring forward, and seem sometimes inconsistent with each other, the number and details of the criminal trials which they describe often fail to justify their charges of excessive cruelty in the emperor, and many of their statements as to his secret feelings and designs must have been incapable of proof. It was probably from prudence, and not from mere irresolution, that the prince continued his provincial governor so long in office. It may have been from true policy rather than from jealousy, that he recalled Germanicus from useless forays on the borderlands, from good sense rather than from want of spirit, that he discouraged all excessive honours to himself. In these and many like cases Tacitus and other writers may have given a false reading of his motives, as they have certainly reported, without weighing, the scandalous gossip that blackened the memory of a ruler who discredited his best qualities by ungracious manners, and often made his virtues seem as odious as his vices. But of the natural character of his younger years we know little. We see him trained in a school of rigid repression and hypocrisy, cowering under the gibes and censures of Augustus, wavering between the extremes of hope and fear, tortured by anxiety at Rhodes, drilled afterwards into an impassive self-restraint till natural gaiety and frankness disappeared. When power came at last, it found him soured by rancor and resentment, haunted by suspicion and mistrust, afraid of the Senate and Germanicus, and yet ashamed to own his fears. Too keen-eyed to relish flattery, yet dreading any show of independence, curbed by his mother, and spurred on by Sejanus into ferocity inspired by fear, with an intellectual preference for good government, but still with no tenderness or sympathy for those whom he ruled. Possibly the partisans of Agrippina troubled his peace with their bold words and seditious acts, or even conspired to set her children in his place, and drove him to stern measures in his own defence. At length, when the only man whom he had fondly trusted played him false, his old mistrust settled into a general contempt for other men, and for the restraints of their opinion. These safeguards gone, he may perhaps have plunged into the depths of cruelty and lust and self-contempt which made Pliny speak of him as the gloomiest of men, tristissimus hominum, and led him to confess in his letters to the Senate that he was suffering from a long agony of despairing wretchedness. Even from the distant east, we read, came the scornful letters in which the king of Parthia poured reproaches on the cruelty and debaucheries of his brother emperor of the west end of section 7